Hello, everyone. Welcome in. We are so excited that you are here today. We have a great webinar in store for you. Just going to give everybody a few moments to filter in and then we will get started. If you are just joining, welcome in. Really thrilled that you're here. Just gonna give it about one more minute and then we will get going. Alrighty, looks like we are ready to begin. Thank you so much again for joining. Uh, if you have any questions that pop up during the presentation, please feel free to just drop those in the question box on the right hand control panel and we'll be, uh, we will be sure to get those answered for you. Uh, and at this point, I am going to turn it over to our wonderful presenters. Thank you so much, Madison, and thank you all for joining us today for this session. We're going to be talking about play correct ransomware. Uh, what I wanted to do for today's session here was to talk about the research behind this type of threat and the ways that we do this here at Attack IQ, and also show you what you can do about it with the Attack IQ platform. Um, <clears throat> I've been joined here today by uh, by Andrew Costas on our threat research team. So just to give you by ways of introduction, my name is uh, Joseph or Joe Master Marino, uh, I'm Director of Sales Engineering for North America here at Attack IQ. I've been with Attack IQ for uh, a little over, I guess, two and a half fish years or so, and, uh, and nearly 20 years in the industry as well. So uh, really happy to be doing all of these here today and really to work with uh, with really great people like Andrew as we work through the uh, the research development and then what you can do about testing for these types of threats. Uh, uh, Andrew, we'd like to introduce yourself, please. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Joe. Well, um, firstly, yeah, thank you everyone for joining. So um, I'm Andrew Costas. I'm the chapter lead of the adversary research team. I'm based in the UK and I'm coming up three years now at Attack IQ. And I've also been in the tech and cybersecurity space for over 20 years. And I guess my background in recent times, um, I've been a senior threat researcher and a malware analyst, um, both at VMware Carbon Black and Logarithm Labs. And yeah, I'm very passionate about adversary emulation, purple teaming, threat informed defense, and obviously helping customers to improve their cybersecurity defenses. Sweet, thanks for that. Uh, so to give you an idea of what we're going to go through today, uh, Andrew did mention what part of the organization he's with. I'd like to share a bit of that with you as well to give you the benefits of the, the adversary research team and the art. Uh, this is the team that is putting together all of that research for the amazing content that we have in platforms specifically built around a lot of these threats. You're going to learn how the art works through their research into something like play. So when we build out these types of emulations, this is a good idea of what's going into that. Uh, I'm then going to give a live demonstration of the platform where we already have this content in platform and where I've already executed it against some live hosts. So we'll go through all of that. And then we'll also leave you with some attack IQ resources and things you can do afterwards. So Andrew, uh, I'd like to turn it over to you so you can start talking about the benefits of the adversary research team. Sure, thanks so much, Joe. So yeah, let's let's spend a few minutes talking about what it is that we do. So as a quick introduction, the adversary research team or ART, 
are a essentially there are a group of highly specialized individuals from around the world that are here to develop cutting edge insights on the latest threats and campaigns carried out by both e-crime and nation state sponsored groups and actors. So our team spans across four, four different countries, spread across three different continents, and possess a huge range of skills, ranging from reverse engineering malware to threat research, cyber threat intelligence, software development, and all of which stem from a combination of both offensive and defensive security backgrounds and experiences. Essentially, our goal is to produce and release timely content and deliver value for our customers as well as the wider community. By providing actionable guidance for relevant threats and aligning to the MITRE ATT&CK framework, we help our customers to validate their cyber defenses against known adversary behaviors so that they can find and remediate gaps and improve their overall security posture. So how exactly do we operate on a day-to-day -day basis? At a very high level, this is the kind of overall picture in terms of the adversary research team's pipeline or workflow. So typically what we do is we start off by prioritizing and planning our work. Not only do we cover new and emerging threats, but also historical threats where perhaps CTI sources have gradually come to the surface over a longer period of time. Next, we move on to the intelligence collection phase. So this is an ongoing area, and this is a big part of where we invest a lot of our time monitoring for e-crime and nation state groups and actors targeting a wide range of nations, regions, and sectors. Once we have our content lined up, we will then extract and then map the TTPs, which will directly feed into creating a mock-up of what our final content will eventually look like. During this particular phase, we'll assess what scenarios we have available in the platform today, as well as look to develop new scenarios for any new TTPs that we encounter. Scenarios are then developed, tested, and allocated to the assessment where final testing, polishing, and QA happens. Finally, the content will be released and placed into the customer's hands. And once that release happens, this content will be made available and visible in the dashboard as soon as a customer logs into the platform. Now, the content will typically either be in the form of an atomic assessment or an attack graph, depending on the contextual information that we have at our disposal. So in other words, if there is enough information to build a full intrusion set, then typically we would look to build an attack graph. And that is always our first choice, and that is always our first preference. But on occasion, there are times where that context is lacking, and in which case we would fall back to building an atomic assessment. We typically aim to bundle content together into what we call content bundles, which share similar attributes for a single adversary or group. So as a recent example of this, we recently released three particular campaigns for the Darkgate loader. And we do this just because it's relevant and it kind of makes sense. And finally, in parallel, we will also publish a blog post de detailing the new content, as well as guidance that not just customers, but anyone in the wider community can benefit from. Now, in addition to our emulation workflow for planned work, we also respond to cybersecurity advise, advisories put out by the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Now, these acronyms are commonly referred to as CISA's CSAs or CSA. Now, these alerts are a result of the work carried out sometimes just by CISA, as well as other times co-collaborated as a joint effort from other international agencies such as the FBI, the NCSC, MSISAC, and many others. CISA often publish multiple alerts in a typical month, and while these alerts still follow the same emulation pipeline, 
The only difference is that we prioritize these alerts above everything else. Now, in case you haven't come across a CISA alert before, the long and short of it is it's essentially a technical report that includes details for known adversaries or campaigns. Not only do they include the technical details, but they also include mitigations, detections, and general defensive guidance. Now, if you haven't seen a CISA alert before, one thing that has been around for at least the last year or possibly more is underneath the mitigation section, you'll see on every CISA alert that there is a section shown here on the slide to do with validating security controls. And this is really a testament to how important it is, not just from the eyes of CISA, but also from the eyes of Attack IQ, because that's fundamentally what we are doing is we are building content that is designed to test your security controls and to be able to run that content at scale in production for known adversary behaviors. So let's dive in and talk about Play or PlayCrypt. So on the 18th of December 2023, CISA released a CSA under alert ID AA23 352A in relation to Play Ransomware, also known as PlayCrypt. And naturally, Attack IQ's adversary research team jumped into action. This was the result of a joint collaboration between CISA, the FBI, and the Australian Signals Directorate's Australian Cybersecurity Centre, or ACSC, based on their investigations as recent as October 2023. Now, Play Ransomware is believed to have been active since around the middle of 2022, uh, sorry, 2022, where it first made a name for itself due to targeting government entities across Latin America. The reason why it's called Play Ransomware was due to the word play left in a very simple ransom note, as well as the file extension for files that were encrypted that contained the file extension .play. Something else to note is that there have been similarities observed between Play Ransomware, Hive Ransomware, Nokiawa Ransomware, and also Quantum Ransomware, which is thought to be an offshoot of the Conti, Conti Ransomware group. Like all major ransomware players, Play has a data leak site on the dark web. They display a news section where the names and details of their victims, obviously redacted here, are contained, as well as a contact page for victims to reach out by filling in a form and an FAQ section page offering information. Now, according to my assessment in recent months, based on multiple dark web monitoring sources, Play is often listed in the top 10 and sometimes even in the top five for the most victims posted in recent months. And just my opinion, but with the recent takedown and the big news of Lockbit earlier this week, who knows how this might aid and enhance the capabilities for Play Ransomware for them to potentially maybe even capitalize against the ransomware ecosystem. Now, in terms of threat profile, as I've said, play or play crypt, um, they are sometimes also referred to by Symantec as balloon fly, um, but the, the origin is yet to be determined. Um, they are suspected to fall under the e-crime bracket. Their motivation primarily appears to be financial and economic. Their victimology has mostly been across North and South America, as well as parts of Europe. Now, just like many ransomware groups, their attacks are often opportunistic and broad-based attacks, which consequently result in targeting a wide range of industries, which include critical infrastructure and the other ones listed on the slide. Some typical tradecraft include exploiting critical vulnerabilities, such as 40 OS and MS Exchange, as well as the targeting of external externally exposed services such as remote desktop and other VPN related services. Unlike or just like many other ransomware groups, they also use double extortion as a strategy, which includes stealing victim sensitive files first and then encrypting the files afterwards. The reason for this is this often results in the threat of posting this data in the public domain unless the ransom payment is made by a certain date. 
They also use intermittent or partial encryption, whereby depending on the size of the file being encrypted, only certain chunks or file portions are encrypted. This was originally reported by Sentinel Labs some time ago, and the main benefit of this is speed and for defense evasion. Other commonly used tools in their arsenal include Minicats, SystemBC, Cobalt Strike, and AD Find. And I'll discuss some of these in the upcoming slides. So let's talk about the TTPs, and more specifically, as a result of the CISR alert, of course, the adversary research team developed and released an attack graph, which was also based off of earlier research posted by Trend Micro back around July 2023. Now, this attack graph contains the intrusion set for the various TTPs observed, as well as some of them shown in the CISA alert. And this is designed to run against Windows base assets specifically. Now, although at a glance, the attack graph might appear to be complex, there are a couple of items I'd like to point out to hopefully make this a little bit easier to digest. Now, starting the kind of the top layer, we have what are called stages. So in each kind of um, horizontal row, each of those represents a stage. And these are nothing more than just groupings of techniques or what we call scenarios, which describe the intent or the objective of a particular phase or stage of the attack. Each stage contains a name, description, and its own logic. And the logic for the content that the adversary research team release is preset by us. But if you wanted to customize that and tweak any of the logic by building your own attack graph, then you can of course do that as well and tailor that to your own requirements. But the purpose of having stages with stage logic can essentially help to identify stages of the attack that you perhaps were even more or even less successful preventing compared to the entire attack graph overall. The blocks or squares or the steps represent the techniques, which again is what we refer to as scenarios. And then lastly, the red and green lines represent the overall attack graph logic. So for example, if a certain step is or is not prevented, then it will then proceed to, to, to run some other step. These lines are used to control the overall logic of the entire attack graph and introduce critical steps, which will also provide an overall prevention result for the entire attack graph, again, based on whether that particular critical step was or was not prevented. So we'll zoom in a little bit now and just walk through the five stages. So as Attack IQ is a big champion of the assume breach mindset, Many of our attack graphs start with this particular stance. So we're always looking to build things that are post breach. The rationale behind that is that there are new initial access vectors and vulnerabilities coming out on a daily basis. So in other words, irrespective of how the initial access is obtained, it's what comes after the initial access that's important because from that point on, the threat actor is already likely inside the network. So this first stage will start out by deploying a reconnaissance tool, and this is a custom tool that's been developed by Play. And once that's deployed, it will be executed via code injection into a running process or through execution via a service. Now, assuming either of those methods are successful, then persistence will then be established by creating a new window, Windows scheduled task, which again is a very common technique often found in ransomware. The next stage focuses on the discovery of information from the compromised system, such as users, running processes and services. It carries out these techniques using living off the land binaries a common way of utilizing existing native Windows binaries with the goal of blending in to normal activities. And again, this is another common trademark of not just specifically Play, but also many other ransomware groups in terms of how they leverage living off the land or lobin binaries. Next, a network scanner tool is downloaded and additional discovery occurs against the domain controller and the Active Directory environment 
using another low bin called NL test, as well as a third party tool called AD find. Again, another popular choice, which helps to quickly retrieve information from and about the Active Directory environment. The goal of this stage is focused around defense evasion as well as the collection of credentials. So first it starts out by modifying specific registry keys to essentially disable and disarm Windows Defender. Mimikatz is then downloaded and again this is a very popular credential stealer that's been used in many many attacks but it's downloaded and executed in an attempt to steal Windows credentials, which will then be used at a later stage. So the next stage focuses on command and control, as well as the lateral movement. So this is where the Cobalt Strike Beacon and System BC are downloaded and deployed. So the Cobalt Strike Beacon is a popular method of maintaining post-compromise activity. The beacon essentially will contain C2 settings and communicate back to its C2 controller. System BC, otherwise known as Core Proxy, is a popular commodity backdoor or remote access Trojan of sorts, which also offers an additional way of maintaining contact with the C2 controller. Finally, using the credentials obtained through Mimikatz in the previous stage that I mentioned, the attacker will then attempt to use those credentials and move laterally via remote desktop protocol or RDP to other parts of the network. And for the final stage, log evidence is then cleared using, you guessed it, yet another Windows log bin called WebTUtil. Then the play ransomware payload is finally downloaded. And then VSS admin, another log bin, is used to delete volume shadow copies for the purpose of essentially disrupting system recovery and inhibiting that system recovery process once the payload has been executed. Finally, we attempt to encrypt files using 2048-bit RSA, 256-bit AES encryption. Now, one thing to note is there is a very important mantra, um, not just in the adversary research team, but at Attack IQ as a whole. And the mantra is that we do no harm. So for any of you that may have been wide-eyed listening to me at the thought of deleting volume shadow copies or encrypting files we do this in a very precise meticulous way so as to not cause any data loss again all of our content from a scenario up to an assessment an atomic assessment or an attack graph all of our content that we release is designed to run in production safely while doing no harm so hopefully that's been insightful. And with that, I will now pass back over to you, Joe, and you can cover off the rest of the talk. Sounds great. Thank you so much for that, Andrew. Um, did, a, did, a lot of, uh, did a lot of my talking here too on the graph, which is great because it saves us time and then we can get right into it. Um, so let me share my screen then, there we go. Um, this is gonna be the graph itself that Andrew was just talking about, but. Uh, what I would like to get through first is going to be the Attack IQ platform. Now, what we're looking at here, there's three main offerings that we have here at Attack IQ. One of them is called uh, one of them is called Flex, and Attack IQ Flex is going to be uh, it's going to be a bit different from this because what it really offers is more of a hey, let me log in, get a, a one of these packages here, very similar to the packages you see here. Uh, and just run it somewhere. It's totally agentless and how it presents back the and how it runs the attacks, gets back the results, uh, and it provides a, a good level of coverage there. The, the next one that we have is called Attack IQ Ready, and that's more of a, a bit more of a managed service. So you choose when the um, uh, when you want to run all of these tests, and then we have a series of tests that we're gonna run on a regular basis and then send you back some regular reporting so that you can have a good understanding of how your controls are performing against a number of different threats. And what we're looking at here today is going to be the Attack IQ Enterprise platform. Now, this is the, uh, the platform that has easily the most customizability 
in terms of what you're able to do, how you can choose what you want to run, where you want to run it, when you want to run it. So that's what this is going to be running on here today. The platform is, as uh, as Andrew was saying, uh, the way that the platform runs on the agents is that these agents are just going to receive their instructions from the platform up here, and they will run their scenarios with that cleanup process, safe to run in production, not going to really down any of your boxes is the, the goal here. We don't want to stop anything. We don't want to harm anything. We just want to show you where those controls are performing. Uh, so let's take a look. As soon as you log in here, you get presented with this home screen that you see in front of you and this what's new section and recently updated templates showing you a lot of the things that especially on the what's new side that the adversary research team is putting together and, and pushing right into the platform here. I also get a situational of how is my platform performing. So I have a population of agents and you can see over here, we have support for Windows, Mac, Linux. So there's lots of different flavors of the agent that you can put out there. Um, the other part of this is that we're going to pull back integration data. So we're going to integrate with your other technologies there. Did your SIM have logs of this? Did your EDR and your firewall, did they detect these things that were occurring? And then we have a way to hook into those other technologies and pull that information back. We're going to show that in this demonstration here. So the other things that we have here, and just to show you a bit more about the, the feature functionality here, is that yes, the content library, that's all here. To show you these uh, these, uh, these ingredients here, so these scenarios, as I always like to call them, over 4,000 of those are currently in platform today. And these are all of the, the pieces that Andrew and his team are working with when they're building out those threat actor emulations, those malware ransomware emulations. Uh, so these can be used as they are. These can be further configured as they are and customized exactly the way that you need them to be. So you can change any of these parameters to be what you need it to be and then save it as. Uh, this way you can use that same type of tradecraft that that attacker is using, that that malware is using, and just use the scenarios that we already have here because you've built out all of that functionality already. You want to run commands, you want to run scripts, you want to just change some of registry entries here. You can totally do that here in the Attack IQ platform, save it as your own, and then run with it. We also put out the content for you to be able to easily digest. I could go into the assessment templates and go find it right there. One of the things I like is that we're also offering this, uh, something you could just jump right in and grab and then run with. Uh, so what I'll do is I will go right over here to the play ransomware entry. This is exactly the one that we were just talking about. So I click on this entry over here. It's now going to show me a description of what this assessment template is. Now the assessment is that grouping of scenarios that Andrew was just walking me through. Uh, so I give you a write up here for what this thing is, is designed to do, what benefits it's going to provide you. It gives you any configuration notes as well. How is this supposed to be run? You could run things here as system is usually the default. And then you can change that if you wanted to in certain situations, if you wanted to do say a run as, and then take a look at the results in a different way. But this one's designed to run a system, so it's fine the way it is. It'll also tell you for all of those steps that Andrew was just walking through, are there ones that require additional configuration from you? So one of these is going to be Active Directory Discovery using AD Find. It does require the uh, you to supply AD Find. It's really just something that we are, uh, we are not permitted to provide that, that binary ourselves. Uh, so we would just ask that you go ahead and, and provide that. I'll show how that works. The lateral movement portion of it, there is a lateral movement through RDP, and it does require a target and some credentials you can use to move laterally, as well as the collect and encrypt files portion. And I'm going to uh, show you the description of that scenario as well, the configuration of it, and how you configure that to do what you want it to do. Uh, so you see here, all data is backed up and restored after the scenario executes. Like Andrew is saying, always do no harm, and we are not trying to break anything on your end. We will provide sources wherever we can, and then if I want to just run with this, you know, I saw it, I logged into Attack IQ and said, how do I do this? Okay, there's just one button right down here. This is create assessment. Cool. I'm just going to click that. It's immediately going to deploy that template for me so that I can get to that configuration that we were just talking about. So I now take a look at this. Let me just scroll down on screen a little bit here. I'm going to give myself a little bit more screen real estate. Let me just drag that guy down a little bit. Cool. And it's telling me right up top in here in this red bar that, yes, I have some scenarios that require some more attention from me. I'm going to make this less of an eye chart now. And let's get to that 
Uh, let's get to that second section that Andrew was just talking about with the uh, with the local system and network recon and being able to get to a define. So you'll notice that this one here is uh, colored in a red or a pink instead of the white, which is indicating that yes, this one requires some configuration. Um, just like Andrew was saying as well, if I wanted to change some of this stuff around, if I wanted to move these scenarios, I want to change these logical lines, I want to change this scenario itself, I could do that. This is entirely up to me now. But for uh, for, for me, I'm going to leave this the way that the, the art intended it to be and then run it exactly as it is. But I could use this to riff off of and, and build other uh, build other ones as well based on my intelligence and what's important to me as an organization. But knowing that this is all here and done and ready to go is really a fantastic benefit. Uh, so now in order for me to configure this, all I need to do is right click on it once and I can configure these scenario parameters. It's now going to show me what's my, okay, what's my target FQDN as well as my AD find executable. So just add that file. Where's my AD find? Cool. Thanks for that. Apply that guy. And then I'll just go to uh, my domain. So I have a range dot attack IQ.com. Cool. Save that. And that should now go from that pink color to the white color. There we go. Great. Let's zip down to the next one and find that other target there. And I can figure the scenario parameters here. This is that remote desktop one. Now I can do this where I just put in manually the IP address, the domain, the user, the password. Tell you what, I don't have to do that. I can make this easier. Let's do that. So I scroll down past, and this is all the content up here. This is everything I'm gonna run. And then this is where I'm gonna run it. Let's get back to that in a second. But in my advanced configuration section over here, I have these global properties. What we do with these global properties is we make it easier for you to put in parameters for things that you might not wanna to have to do, even if it's just once. Maybe it could be one time, it could be 20 times in an assessment. Uh, it really, it's, it's a matter of what it is you're testing. So what I'll do is I'll put in this network target right over here. That's gonna fly right over to the, the scenario that has that remote desktop. I know that this is the one that I want. I wanna to try to use uh, anti-IQ, the unprotected one. That's the one I want. So I'll just click that radio button, hit apply. And now that's going to apply that asset to that scenario. And then the other thing that I'm going to do is my Windows credentials. I don't wanna to have to go and type in the Windows credentials or go pull them out of the vault. I can have them right here in the platform because ideally I'm using this uh, to have a series of credentials and other types of information that I wanna be able to use at the click of a button so that I can just test these things out and know exactly what they are. So I'll use my no administrative credentials, but still has access to a uh, remote desktop. So again, I click apply. And now that will apply that to any scenario where that has that, uh, that particular tag. Because that's the way that we're organizing the content here in the platform is with tags. We can use that for global properties. We can use that for the MITRE ATT&CK framework because all of this content that we're working with here, this is mapped back to the MITRE ATT&CK framework. So the fact that we're able to see this from the perspective of tactic, technique, procedure, all of this is all part of the platform and the scenarios that we're using. Um, and now that I've done that, yep, that scenario is no longer, and we just zoom in on that, there we go. Lateral movement from remote desktop protocol and I configure those scenario parameters, and now that's all there. So done, cool, I didn't have to do that myself. Uh, the last one here is gonna be that collect and encrypt files. This is the one that, that Andrew is definitely making note of here. And I configure the scenario parameters on this one. We've done the heavy lifting for you. So what extensions are we looking for? What primitive are we using? How many files are we going to go through? And then how many subfolders deep are we gonna go? Is there a specific delay? You can leave all this exactly the way it is. It's completely fine. The only thing that's asking for from you is with this little star right here, where am I going to do my work? For, for this, what I like to do is just to set up a path within this box that I'm going to use for this purpose. So like I'll just use C uh, users and something like a, uh, like a fake office files. That'll do the job. Save that. And now that one scenario will also turn from uh, pink to white. Where are we going to run this? This is where I make the decision of, okay, for the different types of policies that I have, I wanna see how our controls are going to react. Uh, I'm gonna pick, let me just get more of these on screen here, because I have the ability to run this on more than one machine at a time if I want. 
Uh, I'm going to run this on these three boxes right here. These represent my three main policies in the organization I'm using with CrowdStrike. And I'm going to run it once on, uh, just to give you a little acid test here, run it on a completely unprotected box with no endpoint protection and see how far this thing gets. I click apply. And now I have my content, I have my targets, and now I have the ability to run this assessment. If I were to click on demand and then run now, I get this nice fair and final warning that says, hey, you're about to do stuff that's probably going to set off some alarms. We're not doing any lasting harm. We're not making any permanent changes. But if you want to let somebody know, you can grab this file right here. This is a CSV, a comma separated value file. That will tell you these are all the attacks that we're about to run and where we're going to run them. So if you want to give this over to your SOC lead, this way they don't panic and start shutting down machines and quarantine things. That's uh, that's that's up to how you want to run this process of this exercise. If you want to test your people and process in addition to your technology, uh, but we give you that option. I'm not going to run this now because I've already run this and I have the results. Now, these scenarios will take, really it's a matter of seconds a piece to run. So when I ran this, it probably took around 10 to 15 minutes overall uh, to run and then start pulling back some results. What does it look like after you've run it and pulled back the results? Now, this is the same one that we were just looking at, except I just name it for myself to make it easier for me to find later. Uh, I take a look at my results. So I ran this on those same four boxes, 10.1, 10.2, 10.3, and the unprotected box. The results that we see here, we can see looking at this histogram, the first time I ran it, I didn't have an unprotected box in there. So yes, I caught everything and I saw everything. But once I introduced the unprotected box with no EDR, no endpoint protection, all of a sudden I went down to a prevention rate of 75%, even though I still saw everything. I can choose those results anytime I like. I now take a look at this, and this looks fairly binary. Either I stopped the attack or I didn't. It's a matter of where. So let's take a look at one of these that we did prevent, and we saw it a number of different ways. And I'll show you how that works as well. Let's take a look at 10-1. This is now going to show me that graph from the perspective of that host. At a glance, what I can see is, yes, I stopped the attack, and I stopped them. It looks about three stages in. So let's take a closer look here and see how the logic played out. So this is what Andrew was talking about before, that we have these different logical pathways. Uh, give myself a little screen real estate again. What we do with this is we try to run, and I'm still not seeing any questions yet. Am I right? Okay. So looking at the first couple of steps here, it tried to download this play ransomware. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. This custom recon tool, it tried to download it over the uh, over the web. So let's test that your network security control. Could you stop that before it hits the box? If this were to not be prevented, is when we would try the same thing on the endpoint and see if you're uh, on the file system and see if your endpoint control would stop it. But we bypassed that step entirely uh, because it didn't get past your network control. At the same time, we would not predicate the entire sequence off of that fairly brittle indicator being the file hash. So that's why we move on to the next step here, the service execution. Uh, and we did move on right there to step four. Actually, because we got to step two and that got prevented, that's why we did that, uh, that backup there of running it over service execution instead. Then we went to step three. Uh, so this is how the process would just follow all the way down. The logic applies for every step along the chain here. And all the way down till we get to the point of dump Windows passwords with an obfuscated minicats, that one did not work and it stopped the train right there. What we then see is all of the results from these scenarios. How did we get here? How did we understand that this is the way that it worked? I'll pick out one of these stages here so that we can see how this worked. And there's some interesting information in here, like this dump windows passwords with an obfuscated Mimikatz. This was prevented and detected both with Falcon directly, because we can integrate with Falcon directly, as well as through the log source that's available in Splunk for it. So we pulled it out that way too. Let's see why we said that. I now expand that, uh, that scenario results. I look at the activity details. We tried to run, and we're going to tell you from the perspective of the test point, the agent, this is what we tried to do. So we tried to run it, but we could not continue executing, most likely blocked by a security tool. When we get to the detections, that's when we're going to know that for sure. 
So if I were to see that here, I take a look at the log and yep, there you go. A PowerShell process with suspicious command line arguments launched under an unusual parent process. There you go. You can review the command line. I take a look at more details here. It will show me exactly what it was that I was just trying to run. There's my raw log. I could also, if I wanted to, use the direct integration to pivot directly over to CrowdStrike itself to find this. So I have evidence that I stopped it and I saw it. That's fantastic. I know what I'm doing with this now. Let's keep doing what we're doing. But to look at the case of something that I didn't stop, especially didn't stop and didn't see, we give you that result as well. I take a look at step 16, the user registry to disable security features, the Windows real-time monitoring, uh, Windows Defender's real-time monitoring. I take a look at this. I was able to create and modify a registry subkey. My activity details, again, will show me this. So it showed me that, yes, I was able to create, and this is exactly what we did. And then, of course, we, we roll it back after we do it. There's some more things in here that I wanted to hit, too, because we didn't hit any detection, so that's a problem, too. We don't have the telemetry, and we need to see that. My observables will tell me that, yeah, okay, this is the way that we ran this. So this was the key that we were changing, and then this is the command that we were using. We were using uh, Reg to, uh, to do that. So, okay, what do I do about this? Mitigations. I scroll down here, I open up mitigations, and what we're doing is we're giving you, of course, some general mitigation uh, recommendations for this. These are all things that you absolutely should be doing in order to prevent something like this from happening. It's all really good best practice. Something else that we're providing here, which is a ton of value, especially when you're trying to build out more telemetry and rules, is these detection rules. So when we're looking at these behaviors like this, uh, we will also provide you with the sigma rules that go along with detecting these different types of behaviors when they occur. So let's take a look at the, and we, we really wrap that into this platform here. So now what we're doing is we're making a dynamic call out to be able to get back the Sigma rules that match with the behaviors of what it is that we're doing. So now you can take this Sigma rule, you can copy this, download it. We had a whole other note, we had a whole another webinar just on this recently where I went over this with uh, uh, one of the people that we have that's running with this project internally, as well as contributing rules to the project because this is attack IQ and we give back. So these Sigma rules are always gonna be here for you when you have those behaviors. If you need to plug that into a different solution like CrowdStrike, like Palo, like Microsoft, like uh, Splunk, you need to be able to get this information into the format that you can use. And that's what we're providing here. So that's a fantastic micro level view of this information. You now have this for every one of these scenarios. And it's providing you the plan for being able to take this information, take it back and then run with it. Because you need to be able to do some work on the back end here. So we're showing you all of the evidence and then what you can do about it. Uh, so this was really me going through There's We can get into much more detail about this. If you ever like, you can reach out. Uh, we can, oh, okay. Uh, we can go through this stuff in more depth. We can go through different use cases in more depth. But what I wanted to show you was that, yes, this is the way that this type of assessment, this attack graph, uh, how this works logically, as well as the results that you get back from it. Uh, you have all of these results in here in platform. You can report on them. You can API the results out and report it that way. You have so many different options here. Um, so at this point, I will, uh, I will end the demonstration. There's just a few more slides that I would like to go through uh, very, very quickly to show you what you can do next. Um, Andrew, I have those slides and the, the ones you sent me, right? I could just put that back up on screen here. Yeah, yeah, it should be fine. It's just the resources, I believe. Oh, okay, so let me get that one up here. And uh, there it is. And go down to my resources section, because now that you've seen all this, you're like, man, okay, great, I want to go do stuff. And I agree with you. So let's go back to my current slide right here. There we go, attack IQ resources. What can you do next? What can you do next? Where can you go? Uh, Attack IQ Academy is something I would always recommend to everybody. Uh, Attack IQ customer or just not an Attack IQ customer yet, you are all welcome to join us here at the Academy. We have high quality instructor led training on different types of learning paths. There are things that use the Attack IQ platform, things that don't use the Attack IQ platform. 
this is our way of giving back to the community so that you can have some free quality uh, uh, training that can also count for CPE credits. So everybody I know needs those CPEs in order to keep those certifications up and running. So we are happy to help you with that too. Uh, over 50,000 students in the platform today, a couple of dozen courses, uh, students all over the world. And this is a really great resource that we have built and continue to maintain and build upon. Uh, oh, if you didn't see the link right there, uh, academy.attackiq.com. <clears throat> There's other Attack IQ resources as well. You can definitely feel free to go over to our website, take a look at uh, take a look at that blog, uh, and especially the stuff that the adversary research team puts out is fantastic. I, I go and read all that stuff too. Uh, so all of that is there for you. We have eBooks that are available online. You can take a look at our YouTube channel for, uh, for replays of our prior demos, webinars. There's a lot of really good stuff in there. We cover a lot of different types of topics. Uh, so definitely feel free to take advantage of all of those resources, reach out to us with any questions, any use cases that you may have, demonstrations that you would like to see. Uh, we would love to hear from you. Uh, so I would like to thank all of you for joining us here today. Big thank you to, uh, to Andrew for joining us and sharing especially his valuable time and uh, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the insight that he's had to share with us. Uh, Andrew, do you have any parting thoughts for the audience here? Uh, no. Great demo, Joe. Um, but yeah, just yeah, obviously, as I said, or I alluded to at the, earlier on um, during my talk, but you know, it's been a, a very big week um, in the ransomware world with with Lockbit. So I think it's quite timely of this webinar and talking about you know potentially yet another upcoming um, you know ransomware group. Um, you know, the Lockbit may have been taken offline, um, but that's not to say that other ransomware groups may not surface you know in the future so um obviously it's much safer and more practical to test an adversary or a ransomware group such as play you know in production safely rather than becoming a victim so yeah with that yeah thanks joe and um thank you everyone for tuning in 100 percent. thank you ac and uh yeah uh, use us to continue testing for not only this but so much more content that we have in the platform similar to this Appreciate all of your time today and joining us uh, and everybody have a fantastic day.